Let's talk about analog stick drift. I see a lot of YouTubers talking about it on Ben Hack Hacks. We actually take things apart and use our hands, or well, my hands. Yeah, I build these single-handed controllers for people. This is well known. And I built a lot of them. Uh, actually, I just did my taxes. Last year, 2021, I built 121 of these for people in one year. Building hundreds and hundreds of them means there is a repair liability. So I would say probably each year I get maybe 15 to back to fix, 15 to 20. And guess what the number one point of failure is? The lower analog stick. If you try to buy these uh, sticks off Amazon, they aren't the actual Alps brand sticks there. And so I have to find ways to repair them when people send them in there when they're damaged. So I thought I would take a look at this and see if we can actually try to clean it up or repair it at all. Because it, the problem isn't the uh, mechanical spring-loaded stick itself, it's the carbon film potentiometer. I'm going to take an X-Acto knife. I'm going to pry in there. Just gently, it's just tabbed in place. All right, so this should be fine. Feels good. I mean, I guess you can put a different spring in it, but I'm sure it's fine. So this is a potentiometer, which means there's a carbon film ring going around it. The wiper, which is a center terminal, connects to the center, and then as you move it left and right, you have a different uh, voltage division between these pins and these pins. So one will have an analog voltage reference, which is usually, well, on the Xbox it's 1.8 volts. On the PlayStation 4, it's 3.3 volts. PlayStation 5, it's 1.8 volts. And then the other side will be ground. So it might be kind of hard to see, but there's two, there's two legs there, and they connect to the wiper. See how there's two rings of carbon? There's one in the middle, that's the wiper. So that connects to those two inner tines. And then the outer ring is the actual test film, and that connects to this riser here. See, it's kind of a little bit of spring loaded to it. So I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try re-bending these out and then also cleaning up the carbon contacts. These things are kind of, they're not unobtainium, but real ones are best. And the only way to get real ones is from dead controllers. A little bit of soap will never wipe away my tears. Knock three times on the ceiling if you want me. Twice on the pipe if the answer is no. Oh, my darling. I wonder if that's enough to fix it. I don't know. It's worth a shot. This controller isn't that old. I mean, I wonder... Is it just re repetition that causes it to wear out? Like when I tested this one, it wasn't that bad. Usually, usually they're a lot worse when you put it on the computer. Instead of trying to buy entire replacement analog sticks, I've had some luck buying just the potentiometers off Amazon. These don't have the same throw range as the real ones. They tend to be more sensitive, i.e. you don't have to move the stick as far to make your character go to the full speed. But they work. Yeah, maybe this will work. Got these adjustment pots so the user can tweak where center is. That wouldn't fix the drift issue because, I mean, people say stick drift, but what I, well, I'll show you what I typically see. Here's the Windows controller test dialog, which hasn't changed since 1995. Way to go, Bill. All right, so this is the lower analog. Now, if it's like really bad stick drift, I'll, let, let's say you move it to the right, you'll see it go like, like it'll like jitter around like all crazy, even though you're trying to move it smoothly. That's when it's really bad. But I can see the stick, I mean, I think it's still bad because like, look, if I go up, it doesn't quite center unless I actually physically move it to center. Down kind of does. I could try one of the crappy analog st sticks from Amazon, remove its potentiometers, put these real potentiometers on and see if it makes a difference. That would narrow it down if it's the carbon film potentiometers or the stick, although I, I still think it's the carbon film that's causing the problem. Look at this controller someone sent in for repair. This thing was rode hard and put away wet. This controller is experiencing classic stick drift. Okay, I'm gonna try to move the joystick to the left. Look at that, whoops. Yeah, see how it kinda like just teleports around? Oh yeah, this is bad, look at that. Zero production values. Now the furnace is running along with a 3D printer. Ha 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 ha. Here's an analog stick laying around. This is the new style one. There's a PCB and just adjustment potentiometers built in. Looks like I pulled one of its analog sticks off. I wonder if the other one still works. Yeah, I could remove this, remove one of the pots and put it on this one. 
Or if I wanted to be really scientific, I could remove both of the pots off this one and see if, if it's a mechanical issue or a pot issue. All right, so I need to desolder this one. You know, I don't even really drink when I make these videos. I know people are like, oh man, Ben must be so, he's probably super drunk when he's saying all this weird stuff. It's like, no, I think there was like two, two scenes. Oh yes, I remember what it was. Um, it was the video where I was fixing the Mario cement factory, and then I'm doing the uh, the ultra bright or retro bright or whatever it's called, and I check on it in the middle of the night. It's like, oh, here's an update of the process. I think, I'm pretty sure I was drunk. And then, oh yeah, it was one of the 3D printer reviews. I think it was the, I think it was the Anycubic uh, Viper. There's like a print going, and I come back to check it. I think I was, I think I was drunk in that one. I had Ubered back home. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm gonna start my 3D printer making something and go to the bar. <laughs> well, that was, that was, oh yeah, that was, uh, that was the day I caught it. You've got it, and what you've got is it. Girl, you've got it, and I wanna give it to you. Come on, get in there. All right, so this is a new analog physical stick with the same carbon film potentiometers that I cleaned. Let's see if it makes a difference. See, that's why I switched to PCBs. It's just easier to solder, but solder. I'm gonna solder. There's no L, because I'm an American. America, solder, yeah. Tried to make me go to rehab. I said, oh, I should have gone. Oh, poor Amy Winehouse. Although she probably should have been named Amy Wine Stomach. Ah, oh, it's still doing it. Look at that. Well, wait, maybe it's the adjustment potentiometers. No, it's still doing it. It must be the... Yeah, so it's the carbon film potentiometer, not the mechanical part of it. I don't know if I have any more of these. What am I gonna do? Paul Newman's gonna break my legs. Ugh, I gotta find some more analog sticks. What's this? Oh no, it's my Amazon dash button collection. There was a time in our past when mankind could splurge on frivolous things, such as microcontrollers inside of refrigerator magnets. But then mankind had a wake up call in 2021 and they could no longer put frivolous microcontrollers inside of refrigerator magnets. In fact, they could no longer put microcontrollers inside of anything. Oh, see, these have all been stripped. Uh, when was it, a year or two ago, Microsoft sent me a whole bunch of like spare controllers for parts. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, is that a precious, oh, a precious analog stick? Yeah, it, it's got to be the carbon foot potentiometers because, yeah, we used a different analog stick. It still did it. So the, the thing that was a, a constant was the potentiometers because the variable was the mechanical analog stick. Yeah, maybe that could be a, a new impression. Story time voice, Ben. Mankind was putting microcontrollers into everything as fast as they could without thinking about the long term repercussions of their actions. Look at this game controller. All you need to do is push buttons, but here is a 32-bit ARM processor from Freescale. Do you know how many cars you could actually finish with this chip? I should practice storytime Ben voice. <clears throat> <clears throat> there was once a scorpion who was wanting to cross a lake. The scorpion looked far and wide for a bridge to cross the lake, but could not find any way. Eventually, the scorpion came across a frog who was sitting at the edge of the lake. Oh, Mr. Frog, said the scorpion, would you please help me across the lake? The frog, being a wary fellow, looked over at the scorpion and said, Scorpion, you are a scorpion. If I carry you on my back, you will sting me, and we will both sink to the bottom of the lake, and neither one of us will benefit from this transaction in any way. The scorpion was aghast. My dear lord, sir, why would I sting you? If I sting you, we both sink to the bottom of the lake. That would be a folly on my part. I might as well just sit here on the side of the shore. The frog took this into consideration and thought, hmm, that's a very good point. Very well, he said to the scorpion. I shall transport you across the lake. The scorpion climbed upon the back of the frog, and the frog began to swim across the lake. However, halfway to their destination, the scorpion could resist no more. He plunged his stinger deep into the flesh of his newly found frog friend. Ah, said the frog. Why would you do that to me? Now I'm going to die and we both will sink. Why did you do it? 
The scorpion looked at the frog as they both began to sink under the waves, very much like Jack and Rose in Titanic, and said, Because, Mr. Frog, it is my way. I'm going to put these new potentiometers onto the original pot mechanism that was, you know, off center. So this is going to be the same mechanical analog stick with new, well, new used potentiometers. So let's see if this narrows down the problem. All right, this is replaced potentiometers. Let's see if it returns to the same spot. Yes, it is. Yeah, before it was kind of going and then it was coming back and then going kind of drifting. Oh, that's awful. What can be done to fix stick drift? Well, what will be done to fix stick drift is nothing. However, what we can do is we can actually look at one way this was addressed in the past. The PlayStation 3, most of the controller models actually used a form of Hall Effect sensor to detect the position of the analog sticks. Let's take a look. Here's a box of, I believe these are Dual Shock 3s, six axis. Okay, can you see anything different? That's right. There are four pins for each analog stick. Oh, look at that. That looks different. So in my right hand is a modern Alps and on the left is a PlayStation 3. Okay, I don't know for certain that it uses Hall Effect, but I'm pretty sure it's Hall Effect. It's made of bits of real Panther. 100% of the time, it works 60% of the time. Let's dig into it. Let's find out what it actually is doing. <gasps> yes! USB mini! Looks like it. Oh, 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 what is that? What's this? What's this? There's things everywhere. What's this? Do, 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 What is this? Christmas planet. What is that? Oh, look at that. Do you see it? Magnets? How do those work? This is a Hall Effect sensor. Oh. So see that white piece with the magnet? That would move freely inside of this. So as far as the sensor is concerned, yeah, it wouldn't have any friction. So what is this, a little circuit board with Hall Effect sensors? We must tear this apart. What's that new X-Acto knife blade that I had? Ugh, every time I do this now, I think about slicing my finger open. <laughs> the anesthesia was the most painful part because they're like, oh yeah, let's just stick this needle right into the wound. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, my last name, Heckendorn, actually was Heckenthorn. So like, you know, Viking, <laughs> some Viking ancestors. Used to be Heckenthorn, but then when they went through Ellis Island, it was changed to Heckendorn. Oh, I depotted it and... Unless I scraped it away, I didn't come across any sensors. It looks like they just got traces in here. So are they doing this just with induced currents? Ah, oh, a bit weird. Let's look at it with the scope. Channel one is the sensor that's still hooked up. Channel two is the sensor I removed. So the pulse is coming from the PCB. You see there's um, a little, I mean, it's very slight. It looks like they're using pulses to induce some sort of induction which will be affected by the magnet, which they can then read, I assume with the same line they pulsed. And yeah, you can see there's a very small dip there and it seems to line up. Oh, it's kind of weird. So they're not using Hall Effect sensors. Yeah, since this only has traces inside of it, I would say this is not a Hall Effect sensor, but they're using the microcontroller to detect the Hall Effect. That is the effect of the magnet on on current. I did some research online. Uh, yeah, this chip appears to be dedicated just to reading the analog sticks. Maybe it's a large um, op amp, something like that. I mean, they would have to have an op amp in order to magnify these signals to be something useful. Yeah, that's well, that's probably why they changed it because it required additional circuitry. Apparently, these analog sticks, there's a thermistor in the circuit as well. Why? That's so crazy. 
maybe that's maybe that's why they stopped doing it. They needed all this extra hardware just to read these sticks. It's like, oh, instead of putting in actual Hall Effect sensors, we'll put in this chip so we can read the Hall Effect and then amplify the signal to something the microcontroller can read versus just a regular analog stick like this. Any Bob's Your Uncle microcontroller will be able to read this via ADC. <sighs> well, you know, Sony likes to take the long way around the barn so yeah, the PlayStation 3 had it figured out long, long ago. And even before that, the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast used Hall Effect sensors for both of the analog triggers and the analog stick. I actually don't own a Dreamcast. I never really cared for the Dreamcast. I know that makes me lose some cred. And you know what I didn't like about it? This controller, I just, I don't like it. The buttons are too far apart. It looks like the USS Defiant, tough little ship, little, but as I mentioned, it uses Hall Effect sensors. Let's look at them, shall we? It'd be funny if you went back in time and was telling people all the things that happened in 2020, and then you're like, and then a Sonic the Hedgehog movie outgrossed a Pokemon movie, and people were like, wait, whoa, 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 no way. See that? Those are magnets. Now if we flip this over, we should find the Hall Effect sensors on the other side of the PCB. I hate how much space these VMUs take up. Oh, but they're so cool. They take up too much space. There they are. One little sensor there, another sensor there. So see how it... Is. So yes, Microsoft copied Sega. Check this out. Oh, see that? Full Hall Effect sensors. And in here is a magnet. See? It's got a magnet. So yeah, the plastic could wear out over time, but the sensors wouldn't because they're Hall effect sensors. The really cool move would be if you could reproduce this in a package the size of this. I do have all of these Hall effect sensors I've removed from Xbox controllers over the years. Because um, what I used to do is I used to get like one of these packages. But these are really hard to find now. I mean, they were hard to find. They were getting hard to find even before everything. But but the, the, the fact that I was putting these in meant that I was keeping all the surface mount ones that came from the controllers. Now what I do is I use these flat flex ribbon cables that I designed so I can recycle the surface mount Hall Effect sensors and put them into my controllers in an orientation that is similar to a through hole chip. But I've got tons of these. I could use these. You know, just put down four of these and try to detect something. This controller is meant to be a Hall Effect sensor. So if we wanted to use this with a normal controller, we would have to trick it somehow. And I'm being rhetorical because I know how I would trick it. We could use one of the AT Tiny One series if you use like the 212. It actually has multiple ADCs, well most chips do, but it also has, I cannot believe this, a DAC, a digital analog converter, which is pretty crazy for such a tiny chip. So you could read two sensors and figure out what your X position is, and then you could use the DAC to spoof the analog voltage that these potentiometers would create. Uh? Now we can't just wire it up directly because we need two Hall Effect sensors to figure out one axis versus one potentiometer to figure out one axis. So the conversion is not going to be one to one. My hair has gotten like blonde over the years. It used to be really red. Then I took an arrow to the knee. Oh, it reminds me, I should make my niece watch some more Laserdisc movies when she comes to stay this summer. Got more. I've got, oh, I could show her George of the Jungle. I bet she'd like that. That's a funny movie. So this also has a spring. This portion here has a little bit of oil on it. Okay, this is probably a little crazy, but why couldn't you just stick a magnet in there and then put Hall Effect sensors under this? Yeah, and then just leave the potentiometers off. Got these three millimeter neodymium magnets. I This is what I use for my single-headed Xbox controllers. I bet that might just barely fit. Probably just 3D print this with a hole, but eh, this will work. Maybe.
I got to be smart about this. If it's sixed in, in there, it doesn't come out. I have to make sure the orientation is correct. All right, so that's my reference polarity trigger for my Xbox controllers, which means this surface of the magnet is what faces the sensor because some of those sensors will not, they'll only detect magnetism on one side of the sensor or they'll only detect magnetism in one of the poles. So active side is going to be down. I think this is shame for it, is it? It fit! Look at that! It's like a little eyeball! You can't trust him. He killed Mozart. Mohu. Zot. Uh-oh. Shoot, maybe it's not going to work. See how it pushed the magnet back out? Oh, it's that rod. Oh, well, let's see. The magnet got pushed out by about uh, 1.75 millimeters. So I'll just remove that much from this rod. I suppose I should put some more oil on it. Found this like 70s vintage bottle of 3-in-1 oil at Goodwill. And I'm going to use the oil because, you know, oil lasts forever. Well, here's the 2018 model of my lower analog shaft for controllers. So this fits under the controller and then the secondary analog stick for single-handed controllers. Secondary analog stick actuates against your leg. Like, so this is your leg. You're like, oh, I'm going to go up, down, left, right. And I actually just invert the stick. Uh, yeah. I have a new version as well. Uh, but this is the one where before I had PCBs for it. Like this. Although, as you can see, the PCB is a slightly different shape. So what I was thinking I could do, I could take my Hall Effect sensor adapters that I have for the triggers, and I could make a jig, a piece of a plastic jig that fits onto here. Although I'd have to take this shape into account, but not a big deal. I can make a plastic jig, and then, because the sensors have to face up, so if I solder the sensor here, I have to face it toward the magnet like that, and then I can make a jig to hold these in, you know, have, have them in the four cardinal directions. It's magically done and delicious. Let's see if this fits. There we go. Probably need some glue. The idea is... Yeah. We use this as a template to glue these in place. So they are equidistant from, equidistant from the center of the magnet. I think this will work. Indiana Jones, we need you for one final mission. Can't you see that I'm old? But I'm still working as a professor for some reason because there's one thing rich professional people do is they continue working at age 79. That's why we need you, Dr. Jones. We've discovered a, a mythical staff of Amun-Ra. The mystical staff of Amun-Ra. It was buried under the ocean for 2,000 years. Then it was discovered by a group of Russian oil drillers, if I believe correctly. That's right, Dr. Jones. And now we need you to pick up the pieces and complete the task. I'm too old. Why don't you ask my son? That's why we're here, Dr. Jones. Your son is the one who's missing. Wait, wasn't my son canceled? Yes. Well, I can tie all the grounds and powers together and then just have four different uh, ADC lines coming out of it. So we could hook it, well, we could hook it up to a microcontroller or we could hook it up to the scope. I mean, well, okay, so if we run these at 3.3 volts, based off the strength of the magnetic field, you're going to see a range from 0 volts to 3.3 volts coming off of the uh, analog line. Although the range is probably going to be somewhat muted because the magnet is small, but you'll we should still see a change, although Again, I think it'll probably be logarithmic, not linear. All right, I got some glue. I'm gonna add this piece just to make sure that it's held in place. That way I can bend these things up without worrying about them coming loose on the inside. I'm gonna let this dry for about 30 minutes, but you don't have to wait that long. Kinda looks like something that would go through space. Woo! I've wired up this squid looking thing. Power lines, or the VCC lines connected and the ground lines connected, and then I have four wires coming off for the four different sensors. So let's see, this would be left and right. So I'm gonna hook this up to the scope and see if we can see any movement. All right, power supply with three volts. Okay, so both lines move to a center point. 
of about 1.8 volts, so that's good. All right, I'm moving the stick back and forth. Yeah, there's not a ton of movement, but there is some. Let's let's zoom in. Let's go to let's go to 500 millivolts. Yeah, see how they move in inverse of each other, which makes sense because you're moving the magnet closer to one and further from another. I've added a measurement for mean voltage. Looks like 1.37 is the baseline, and 1.52, and then what's the other one? 1.2. Okay, so it's about 150 millivolts in one direction and 170 millivolts in the other direction. All right, so if we read that with a 10-bit ADC, what kind of granularity can we get? All right, I have the mean voltage measurement for both of them now. Uh, let's see. So if we go that way, it's 1.52 to 1.2, and that way is roughly inverse. So that's what we want to see. I assume up and down work the same way. I'm going to lower this to 1.8. You should see it change. Uh-oh, did you see that on the scope? Did you see what happened? It dropped out. It stopped working. So these things have a minimum voltage of, it looks like, 2.8. Okay, so I'm probably going to have to find a 3-volt line. So if we have 3,000 millivolts, and the 10-bit ADC is 1,024 segments, that means each tick of the ADC would be 2.9 millivolts. So then if we take, what was the range, 150 millivolts in each direction, divided by 2.9. That means we get 51 steps of granularity in each axis. No, no, that's both ways, yeah. So that's just in one direction, so we multiply that by two. Yeah, because the range is actually 0.3, then we'd have 100 steps of accuracy in each direction, X and Y. That's more than enough. It's a pretty hefty trace coming off of the interconnect here. It's going to some integrated circuit, might, might be a voltage converter of some kind. There's a couple of capacitors, and it's also going down to the accessory port. And there's this depopulated uh, flat ribbon cable connector here with one pin on the side, so I attached a wire to that. I think there's a pretty good chance this is going to be 3.3 volts. And 3.3 uh, volts. Cool. All right, let's uh, beep it out and see if we can trace it back to the castellated board. Switch to beep out mode. You heard it. Oh, it was over there. I think we have a winner winner. Chicken dinner. Bob's your uncle. Ring ring. Hello. You have a collect call from Australia. Would you like to connect? All right. Hello. Oi. This is Dive Jones. Is this Ben Heckendorn? Yes, this is Ben Heckendorn. Blimey. I've got a message for you. W what is it, Dave? Stop impersonating me, you yank. Click. Test point nine is giving a positive result as well. So one final test. We will hook up simulated batteries. See if we still got it. And then I think we can call this good enough for government work or hand grenades or whatever that phrase is. Yeah, okay. So if I remove power to the controller, line goes flat. Reattach power, line is still flat, and there's 3.3 volts. Okay, I think this is a, this is a winner. I've attached our modified analog stick with Hall Effect sensors to a Teensy 3.6. I'm using that because uh, it's a 3.3 volt microcontroller, and I don't believe these sensors work at 5 volts. It's going to be reversed, so as I push the stick up like that, the rod's actually going to point down. So pushing up will move the magnetism toward that sensor and pushing down will move toward that sensor. So it kind of works backwards, kind of like how an arcade stick works. Well, it's a it's a 10 bit uh, ADC, so half halfway would be 512 out of 1024. Well, 1023. I'm going to push up, pushing up now. So we see the 480s. How far does it go? About 470. So is that a range of about 50? Yeah. And let's go down. So we're going to see the next number change. That's 480s. It's going down to 470. About the same amount of range. Of course, we're going to want to write these down. See the 522 on the left. So as I go down with this one, you also see that one going up because the magnet's going even further away from that sensor. Okay, I'm going to go left. And so we see 517, 510, 
490 something, 480. So that one's a little off kilter because the other the other two got to 470. So I guess as the magnetic field gets nearer, the voltage goes closer to zero. And finally pushing to the right, 480, 470. Oh, 466, well that one got even further. I wanna use two AT Tiny 1 series because they have DACs. So I can hook up two ADCs per microcontroller and then have the microcontroller take these two analog values and turn it into a, well, turn it into a, a DAC, a digital analog conversion. It'll turn it into an analog voltage. We can feed that to where the analog stick used to be and then we can spoof the analog joystick. I'm putting this controller together for a single headed controller that someone ordered and I'm gonna use it I think I'm gonna use it as a test bed for drift busters. Do, 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 do. All right, so this is this analog here. 357, your favorite gun. I guess that's as low as we can go. And how high can we go? About 370. Now the positive lead on the multimeter is hooked up to the center tap of the of the pots. So we actually don't need to use the reference voltage in the pot. The ADC in the microcontroller that I want to use, it has reference voltages of 0 0.55, 1.1, 1 1.5, 2.5, and 4.3. I I will set it to 1.5 because as we saw, the highest voltage that we need to spoof is 1.38. So we have 1500 millivolts divided by 255 steps of the DAC that gives us 5.8 millivolts per step. So if we have a delta of well, if we average it out to a delta of 500, basically a half a volt. So 500 divided by 5.88 millivolts means we get about 85 clicks in each direction, which is actually more resolution than the Hall Effect sensors will have, so I think we should be good. Ah, one more test. I have my bench power supply going to 2.4 volts, which simulates two rechargeable batteries. So a rechargeable battery, yeah, it's... um. Maximum voltage is 1.2, which is why batteries that are or devices that are battery powered have to assume that they will only have 1.2 volts to work with. These are AT Tiny 212 microcontrollers. You've seen me do projects with them before. One series actually has a DAC, a digital to analog converter. So you put a value into a register, and then one of the pins will output a analog value based off that number, which is pretty cool. You don't usually see that on small microcontrollers like this. Let's make sure this still fits together. I can feel a little bit of a pinch, but it just barely fits. So this would fit into my standard lower analog assembly. Oh, those way more wires than usual. Usually it's only four. This is eight power, ground, and then four, wait, that's six. <laughs> okay, I guess that's not that bad, six versus four. I put everything into the six pin ribbon cable. So you got power, ground, and then the four uh, Hall Effect sensors going into the two chips. Now I just need to wire up a programming port and a way to switch which one is being programmed. Oh, I know, I could just use these big gaping holes in the side of the controller. I don't need to church it up. I'm just gonna have, I'm just gonna have four pin header. VCC, ground, V, and H. All right, so I'll just, I'll just plug wires in there. That'll work. Okay, that should be everything. I think that's about the most wires I'd want to put in this. Oh man, look at all those wires. I have to cram it in here and... Down my Atmel ICE programmer, I'm gonna use it for UDPI programming. I've got the three leads here that'll plug into the side of the controller. Let's go into Atmel Studio and see what we can see. Please, human, let me into room of experiments. I can has immediately start biting cord that you're using for recording. Okay, I went into device manager. I'm looking at the controller. I just plugged it in. Um, the left analog stick is kind of stuck in the upper right hand corner. So that's probably the, uh, the tri-state of the microcontrollers that we're seeing. So for starters, let's get the microcontroller set up. And then we'll set a, de a, a DAC value to try to get this crosshair to be in the center. ATtiny212, interface UDPI, apply. And I can't find it. I had the program wire going to the wrong pin on the microcontroller. Wow, I'm lame. Okay, now we're good to go. 
And yes, I'm going to totally cheat by using a reference project that's open in the other monitor that you can't see. All right, a couple things to think about. This is a five volt device. We can run it at a lower voltage, but we have to run it at a lower speed. We can't exceed 10 megahertz, it looks like. I like putting my curly brackets here because, because I do. CCP, the Change Protection Control Register. So there's certain registers on the chip that you have to, that are protected. And if you want to write to them, you have to write to this register first. And then you have, I believe, three to four cycles in which to write the next register. Okay, so we need the clock controller. Let's go to the data sheet. Clock control. Then there's all this. Got you suckers. Register summary. And let's see, we need three. All right, so this register allows us to change the prescalar division and the amount. See how this is all bitwise? So we're going to, let's let's do this just to cheat. So we're going to grab that over here. We're going to type clock control should fill in for us. Then that is the particular register. And now we're going to, well, we want to have one no matter what, because that is the LSB. That means we want to enable the divider. And if we put nothing else in these bits, see how if P div three down to zero is zero, we get a division of two by default. So we want a division of four, but we have to bit shift it. So we need to put the value one in there. So we're going to take the value of one. I'll write it in hex bit shift one to the left. And that's going to create a byte that looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, dun, dun. Divide by four equals five megahertz. I guess we could go even slower, but and this is very armish of it. We need to wait for the clock sync. I mean, we probably don't have to, but we probably should. So per the devices and printers, oh, look, you can see all my stuff. Hashtag docs joystick. So let's try to get this centered for starters. Now remember, we're, each chip is one axis, so we're going to work on the, I believe this is the, this is the vertical axis first. So it's going to be the up and down. So it'll still be stuck to the right, but it'll at least be centered. So let's look up what we need for the DAC. Blah, blah, blah. Then there's all this. Let's just jump to register summary. Of course, there's not much to it. Okay, output, enable DAC. Okay, so I believe it's DAC zero. So control A. I'm going to cheat again. DAC zero. Is that what it's called? Yes. Okay. DAC zero dot control A equals enable DAC. Okay. Uh, we talked about this. So we're going to, we're going to shoot for 1.5. Okay. Let's see. Control A, DAC ref select two down to zero. All right, so we want one point, that's, that's weird, they're not in order, look at that. So we need the number four there. Wait, where were we just in control A? Oh, no, no, that's V ref control A, okay. See how this can be confusing? V ref dot control A equals 04. What did we say, about half? Dax C data equals 128. It can't be that simple, right? Wasting my time. What's the what's that the kids say? You're killing me, Smalls. All right, it made no difference. Ah, here's a microchip data sheet. The DAC output pin needs to have the digital input buffer and the pull-up resistor disabled in order to reduce its load. I guess that's what we missed from the data sheet, but I'm trying to do stuff in here. I'll squish you later. Oh, I, I see what I missed here. I didn't set output enable in the control A register. Uh, now it's doing something. It's weird that it's not going lower than that. Let me try to slow it down. All right, let's go into the middle. It's going from zero to, okay, I need to go higher than that. Yeah, because it's not going to go higher than 1.5. What was the voltage we had? 1.37? 1.37 divided by 1.5 is 91% of 255 is 232. Oh, now I gotta go in the slow mode. Slow mode. Will it go past the threshold? Oh, there it goes. It's going so slow. And it should go back up. Great. All right. Now that we know, we know the DAC works. Let's uh, make some functions. Void get ADC. Uint 16T. 
All right, uh, let's see. So when you have an ADC, you have a bunch of ADC capable pins, but only one is connected to the sampler at a time. So let's see, that's MUX position. Okay, so we're using ADC pin one and two. ADC zero, MUX position equals one. Set up for reading A1. Then we're going to want to start the conversion. There's some other stuff we have to set up first, but I'm just going to do this. So command start conversion will, okay. ADC zero command equals start conversion. Now we have to wait for the conversion and then we'll do this again for mux position two. Okay, int flags is that. So we're going to go while not ADC zero int flags and the LSB. So wait for conversion. And then we need to read the conversion. Uh, that would be under result, I believe. Okay, looks like it's in two bytes. Uh, I get the feeling this would be handled automatically by the compiler. Yeah, it looks that way. Value zero equals ADC zero result. All right, ADC zero, control A. So we run standby, yeah, sure, why not? Full resolution, free run, zero, enable, one. Okay, so control A equals, I guess we could do it in binary. So it would be one, one, two, three, four, one, zero, one. Uh, let's see, control C. Okay, sample, cap, capacitance, select. We want VDD as a reference, and then the prescaler, I guess we could divide by eight. Uh, we're also going to have to disable the other functions on those two pins. So that's going to be pin one and two. Oh, don't do that. Okay, now we need control C. So we want reference select, we want VDD. All right, so that's going to be zero, 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 one, zero, prescaler div for probably be good. So zero, zero, one. Reference select one, which is VDD, one, one, two, one. VDD ref div four. That should be enough to make it work. All right, let me just shotgun some of these values and let's see if we can make it work. Fun fact, if you see some weird stuff going on, it's because if you hook a game control up to Windows 10, it'll actually move some things around in the menus, see how it went to that pancake menu just there? I'm gonna do a really simple example. Get ADC, DAC zero data equals value zero divided by four, or dit, dit, dit. Yeah, I think I found the problem. So I hooked this up to my meter to make sure that there were still analog values coming off the ADC to make sure that nothing broke, and there were. Yeah, so I was looking at int flags. Like, this is what you check to make sure that the result is ready. So you wait for this to turn into a 1. Then it says, the result ready interrupt flag is set when a measurement is complete and a new result is ready. The flag is cleared by either writing a 1 to the bit location or by reading the result register. All right, so it says, or by reading the result register. Uh, but what was happening was it wasn't working. So then I found another set of code, this time on GitHub. So start the conversion, wait until it's done, clear the flag and read result. So I tried that on my side. And now when I move the analog stick, uh, uh, granted it's not scaled correctly, but you can see now there is movement. So that was the issue, that is weird. So I guess the data sheet was wrong. Spider-Man, he's given up. Abandon his sad little crusade. The power of the press triumphs. I had to tweak a few values. I think I need to tweak them some more, but I think I have it working. So we basically say, okay, if one of the sensors goes below a certain threshold, then we move the deck in that direction. If the other sensor goes below a certain threshold, because as the magnet gets closer to the sensor, it gets closer to ground. Then we go in the other direction. Okay, I'm gonna move the joystick to the left and to the right. Nice. 
Now that's the H position. If I program the same thing to the other chip, that should give us up and down. Although my luck, it'll be backwards. All right. Okay. I'm just going to pull out the programming cable, put it into the other one. Let's give that a flash. Yeah. See, it's a little off. Okay. Up, down. And of course it's backwards because just my luck. The up and down needs some tweaking, probably because the first one was tweaked to left and right, but it looks like it generally works. All right, I'll dial in some numbers. It's a modified Hall Effect Sensor joystick going into a microcontroller and then spoofing a DAC to trick the Microsoft Xbox controller into thinking the potentiometer is moving. All right, let's demonstrate how this single-handed controller works. Um, it works the same way as the other ones. Basically, you put the lower analog stick against your leg, and then if you want to go up, you move the whole thing up. There goes the cursor, center, down, left, and right. Cool. And then we can, of course, do our other controls as well. There's the new D-pad. Well, there you have it. A demonstration of how you can convert a normal carbon film potentiometer analog stick controller into a Hall Effect sensor joystick using the same joystick size. And obviously there's more room here than inside of here, but relatively the same package size. Again, this is a more expensive way to make a joystick, which is why they don't do it. But I just wanted to make this video to talk about why they fail and how they could be better. And <laughs> like so many things, they were built better in the past. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Maybe a few console generations from now when sensors are available again, Hall Effect sensor analog sticks can make a comeback. Again, Microsoft uses them for the joysticks here, which is great. Uh, but, you know, you'd be talking about at least six more to do the two analog sticks. But, you know, proof of concept. Drift Busters! Do, 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 do.